one thing we've discovered from all your emails and comments is that not all of us live in the countryside. Some of us live in cities. So we've dedicated this episode of the A to Z to Bushcraft to urban survival. That's a nice find. Now we have here rose hips growing wild. Now before you can use these as food, you need to remove the irritant seeds from the inside. Now these are not good to eat because they can irritate your stomach and you can see why. You've got all these small irritant hairs over the outside. Now, at one time, people used to use these as itching powder. So naughty schoolboys would throw this down the back of someone's neck and they'd be itching all day. So I wouldn't advise you to do that, but uh, that's definitely one possible use if you want to get up to mischief. Now, the outer part of this, the red part, once we've removed these seeds, this part here can be very gently heated, not boiled because that would destroy the vitamin C content, but if you gently heat it, possibly with a bit of sugar, you can, you can make rosehip syrup, which is a very, very popular tonic, um, very, very popular during World War II when it was encouraged that people should collect rosehips and make rosehip syrup in order to stave off malnutrition. Now, it's not only small shrubs, and herbs that will grow in an urban environment. You can also find trees growing as well. Now these are self-seeded. It means nobody's planted them. They've just found their way here by themselves, either in bird droppings or just airborne. Now, this is an ash tree. And if this area lays dormant for a long period of time and no one develops it, this will grow into a full-sized tree. Not totally uncommon to find ash trees growing feral in urban areas, in waste ground, all over the place. So for certain projects, you could possibly find the materials you need, even in a city, for all sorts of things. Now, ash being one of my favorite woods for lots of carving applications, as long as it's not something for use with food because the sap is mildly toxic. So really nice to see, very good survivor. This, this plant will find its way absolutely anywhere. Now this is a classic urban plant. It's called budlia, or the butterfly bush because it attracts butterflies. You can see a couple there. Now, those are red admirals. Now the butterfly bush will always be found on waste sites or anywhere that's been abandoned. And the reason it's so common in these places is because it can survive anywhere. You quite often find it high up on the sides of buildings, just in cracks in the wall or in chimney pots, places like that. Anywhere that a seed may have got to, either in bird droppings or just blown there, and then this bush will grow. And it's a fascinating bush, amazing stuff. So if you can imagine, if people all disappeared overnight, in a century's time, all our cities would just be covered in this stuff. It would be like a jungle because it'll just get into any cracks in the pavement. It'll break up all the concrete. It'll be pulling down walls. It's a, an amazingly powerful plant and it will just colonize absolutely any piece of waste ground. It's not much use to us for food, but it does have one fascinating use and that is for making fire. What we're looking for is these long straight shoots. Now, if we're gonna use these for friction fire lighting, we wanna find the longest straight shoots that we can find, cut these off, season them for a while. They dry out quite quickly and then they can be used for friction fire lighting using the hand drill method. So for urban survival, this could be a number one choice. Another really common waste ground plant. Now this is called ribwort or plantain. This is the lesser plantain. It's the long thin leafed version. Now plantains are really useful for medicinal purposes. They're very, very effective as antiseptics and they also have properties as a hemostat. It reduces blood flow so it can be used to help blood clot. So if you make a poultice or an infusion of this and use it on an open wound, it will help to control infection and it will also help to stop the bleeding. So very, very useful in that respect. Now, as a food source, the leaves themselves are quite fibrous, especially at this time of the year. When they're a bit younger, and especially the very small ones further down. They are edible, but they are a little bit tough and fibrous, so not my first choice. What is useful, though, are the seed heads. Now, you can see these ones here, and we can break these seed heads open, and what we're looking for are these little black seeds inside here. Now, it would take a while to collect enough of these as food, but certainly in uh, Native American cultures, these were an important source of food, and people would grind these up between two stones and make a sort of flour. And here we have another self-seeder. This time it's a sycamore. So just look out for leaves that look like the Canadian flag. 
and you won't go far wrong. So sycamore self-seeds itself. You can find it all over the place. A lot of people in forestry work, tree surgeons and such, just look at this as a weed, but I think it's quite an attractive tree. It has a lot of uses, very, very good for making things like spoons. And you can also make whistles out of it, as we showed you in the last series. Now, as a self-seeder, this has found its way here. Who knows how? These little tiny seeds, which look like little helicopters, can get blown quite long distances. And you'll find these in people's gardens, and they'll drift into waste ground like this, where they may sit dormant for a while, and eventually will start to grow. And this tree, like the ash, will grow to a full-size tree if no one cuts it down. So another good survivor. So another tree that we're likely to see all over the country if people just disappeared overnight. This is a sort of survivor tree that will emerge from the ruins. During the Second World War, when rationing was in progress, people were encouraged to go out and exploit the hedgerow harvest, as it was called. And that meant going out and finding hedgerows and collecting edible herbs and useful herbs from it. And the classic one was this one, the stinging nettle. Now, it can be used for all sorts of things. It's really good as a tea or a herbal infusion, and it's also an excellent edible green, so it can just be boiled up and served with potatoes or whatever. Um, really, really good in soup as well. These look incredibly healthy, but I won't be eating them because I suspect dogs have peed on these ones. Now, there's another plant that needs no introduction at all. That's the bramble bush. Find it anywhere. Any bit of waste ground, you'll find one of these. And of course, they're a fantastic place to look for blackberries. And there are loads here. And you can pick them in such quantities as well, you know, it's like... And they've got a very long growing season. So you can find these from sort of the middle of August right through to October at times. So really good. And the best thing is they're free. Fantastic. Where the wind blows, where the river meets the sea, I'll be waiting. For the day when you come back to me, I'll be waiting.